but you need a library. You need like a a good library of of content for your for your niche. Um, I think that's something all big brands with tons of traffic have is a lot a lot of content. Um, and the other thing is is like links. Hello, everyone, and welcome to another episode of the South Sessio Show. I'm your host, George Hasiotis, and today I'm very happy to be joined by Ben Goody. Ben is the founder and creator of How the Fact, a website that provides SEO case studies and innovative strategies for content marketers and SEO specialists. He has previously worked as the head of demand gen at Customer Gorge, brand and demand lead at Santisum, marketing lead at Apps Health and Venture Capital Associate at Early Metrics. Quite a journey, uh, and I would like to learn more about this journey. Uh, ben, welcome. Thank you so much for having me. So it seems to me that you did quite a few things before launching How the Fact, uh, but I would like to, to dive into this experience a bit more and um, learn how you know one thing led to another until you get to the point where you're like you know what i have accumulated all this knowledge and now it's time for me to um create a, a website a community and a newsletter that educates people about some of the things i've learned or you know all of these things I, i've learned over the, over the years so i guess this is a a good way to to start this conversation yeah, for sure. Um, so I, I started How the Fuck about like in the middle of all of that journey, like the the, the history that you that you described. And I only went full time working on it a year ago, um, but it had been around for like two years before that. Um, and it was originally a podcast about marketing in general, B two B marketing. And then you know it slowly grew, and it was part of my like. You know, it's something I was building on LinkedIn. It was like a fun thing to do on the side kind of thing. And then, um, yeah, and then I went full time on it because it started to like get traction. It got sponsored by Ahrefs and then I niched down into SEO. Actually, I niched down into SEO before that. And that's why it started to get traction. Um, I kind of pivoted my whole like brand focus onto SEO and content marketing. Um, and obviously I'm like that, that focus bought the right kind of audience and then it grew and it got sponsors and it became something that actually would yeah sustain me in my uh in my in my life basically like give me help me help me not need a job essentially um but why but why i started it i mean i i the the real reason i guess i started it is that like you said i was working as a venture capitalist like associate at a at a, a, a it was a startup in itself it was like a startup rating agency and from there, I jumped to one of the startups that we I had met through that. And because of that, like I was new to marketing, I suppose. Like, I didn't know anything. Um, we spent a year like doing all sorts of marketing, learning, and me learning from everyone. Um, but on that journey, I had this like real need to like learn. And the way I learn the best for me is to interview other people, like to talk to other people to then like go away and practice what they do. So it was actually a bit of a Trojan horse for me to get to like really high level people. And like the first ever interview I did, so this is bear in mind like a year or two into my marketing life. I've got like April Dunford as my first ever interview guest, who if you don't know her, she's like, yeah, queen of positioning, like one of the very senior positioning people um, in the world. And her, her episode, went like viral instantly, which was, yeah, the, we, we peaked on like episode one. My website got like 30,000 views overnight. Um, I think it went viral on Hacker News, went to the top of that. And that kind of kicked off the whole journey. Um, yeah, yet to go back to that peak, but I think I have something better now, which is like sustainable, sustainable growth and like healthy numbers instead of one-time spikes. But yeah, it kind of helped me put it on the map. Um, and, and like start it off. Um, but yeah. And then I think over the next few years, I realized that SEO and content is like my specialty and like my passion. And I started to think, how can I bring that to 
like my knowledge of it to the podcast and learn from other industries that I I haven't been in from like the best in the business and get them on the episode and get get them on the show. Um yeah, so yeah, I mean if anyone is listening and wants to do their own thing, I don't think you have to wait till you're like super experienced to start to start sharing things. Like it's just as useful to be the guide and the, the person learning alongside your audience, I think. Um, and you learn a lot along the way and eventually you do become the expert. So it's, uh, it's worth it really. It's, it's a fun way to learn. Um, yeah. What is, uh, how the fact today, because it started as a podcast, but then it evolved, uh, over time. Right. So, um, today, what can people find, uh, when they visit, um, the fax website yeah if you go to the website i think um you'll get the message that it's about helping people learn to scale their like search um search as a channel um in terms of revenue and traffic um but it's a it's a mixture of things it's a free newsletter it's a premium newsletter it's a podcast um recently bought out an ebook which is about how to build a content operation and and scale like basically it's like how i work with my clients now it's like the blueprint for like building your own content um operation and 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 that kind of thing and being able to scale co- like quickly and cost efficiently kind of thing without using ai for for the record i get a lot of people asking me that like how much is this ai and i'm like no, actually none um which I I think is a plus. Obviously, some people are, are really into AI at the moment. I'm sure we'll go into that um, later. But yeah, so it's, it's a mix of things. Like I want it to be a community, um, and as it moves forward, like people will see that. But yeah, at the moment, like it's it's much more like a premium subscription with like a bit of a surround sound. Like you can listen to the podcast, then you can get the newsletter insights. You can get like um, me on LinkedIn and and all of that kind of thing. But now. We were discussing this before we started the recording. Whenever I get on, on LinkedIn, which is not so often nowadays, I see a lot of, uh, or even Twitter, uh, I see a lot of fear mongering around SEO, even for, from people who are like, who, who practice SEO, which, you know, surprised me uh, the most. And there is a lot of fear mongering and people are somehow concerned about the future of it and whether or not it will continue being a, or it is a, a viable, um, let's say acquisition channel or content dis- distribution channel, depending on how you see it. Yeah. My question is, are you still bullish on, on SEO? Do you think there is a, a future for, for SEO? Uh, it's a very good question. And yeah, I think anyone who is plugged into the SEO space will have seen that like every few months someone is declaring SEO dead and that's been the same for the last 20 years or however long SEO has been around for. Um, I'm still bullish on it. I do think it changes and evolves, but that's always been the SEO industry. Like that's how, like it's it, how it works. It's, it's how it all works in the end. Like Google has their own thing that they're doing and they don't work for SEOs. Like SEOs are helping people get seen in Google. Like Google are not trying to make something that works for SEO. Like at the end of the day, they're trying to, in their own way, like build, well, as they've shown recently, I think build a business um, for themselves, which is pretty obvious. Like they're a a big old capitalist machine, but um, I think you just have to take that with with a pinch of salt, like play the game listen to what they are saying, but also take it with a pinch of salt. Like, I don't think SEO is dead. Um, I don't think it will be for a long time. That being said, like you can't expect one channel in a marketing mix to be exactly the same forever. Um, they're always evolving. Every, every channel is always evolving. Um, uh, so like, like Hub, HubSpot's inbound marketing methodology was like the best thing up until now. And it's like the tide is changing. People are like, I don't want to download your freaking ebook and get a drip newsletter for the next six months. Like it's not how marketing um, works anymore, really. It's not how, how good marketing works anyway. Um, and I think it's the same with SEO. Like 
if you want to hack the system and um, create the lowest quality content that you can just to get traffic. And yeah, I don't know. I'm not convinced it was working for you anyway. So if, yeah, yeah, I think, I think I, I'm still bullish on it. And I still think, especially for people who are willing to create content that is differentiated and stands out and, and also build a proper brand alongside their, their SEO. Um, the question, the question though here is, and I will get back on my SEO, but the question is, you mentioned HubSpot's inbound marketing playbook, let's say, mm. which, you know, served not only HubSpot, but many other brands all these years, right? I feel as you uh, said that this playbook starts to change if you know it has it has changed already but let's say that it starts to change um but the question then is what in your opinion is the the new playbook uh that will take us to to the next uh you know stage of of growth um or sustainable growth as as vcs like to put it and sustainable prof profitability um in the next years yeah, that's that's um, that's a hard question, isn't it? I mean, I I am um, I can tell you, I guess what what I am like bullish on. Um, I think from an SEO perspective, I think I think it still all works very well. So I still think it. I still think focusing on like high intent pain points, like topics that really make sense for you, like going really like really human written content that that like wows people instead of bores people like that I'm bullish on and keep link building because that's actually what works I think like then if we're talking B2B SaaS I would say like we're just coming into this period where everyone is realizing that in B2C people buy from people but in B2B they don't at the moment or they they are starting to want that um so i think personal brands in b2b and like or being more um being more creator driven in b2b like like working with influencers across linkedin and 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 twitter and things getting endorsements like that is a way to grow like very very quickly um it's a lot harder if you're not if if for example you're not tapping into marketing and sales people because that's what linkedin is full of like in my past, we've we've targeted customer service customer service people, for example. It's really hard to find anywhere online where they all hang out. So it's really tough. Um, but yeah, I think just because there is not a clear channel right now doesn't mean that there couldn't be. And if you're really willing to invest in like really high quality content, I just I think it hasn't changed that people people really like to buy from like their educators and they trust like the people who i don't know they, if you have quality content they love like i think it should reflect the inside of your company too so um yeah yeah i think really like good product marketing combined with really good content is going to be like a is, is unchanging but if you really want to grow quickly right now i think b2b creators and people and personal brands um Okay, yeah. we will get back to that um, high quality content because I, I would like to hear your thoughts on like what this is exactly. But you, I will I would like to um, continue with with SEO and ask you. We were discussing before the recording um, the changes, the upcoming changes on Google search uh, based on like the introduction of uh, SG and the search generated experience in, in search. And I would like to hear your thoughts on how this will affect traffic, uh, the traffic that websites get. And I mean, what can website owners and brands and publishers do um, about the the upcoming change, changes? Yeah. Um, yeah. This I think it's it's a little unclear still. Um, but I know like, I know like what I said to you before the call, um, as so I'll, I'll, I'll repeat that now. I think like 
a lot of that top of funnel content if you look at what it is out there it's not that i don't think it's that good anyway like i think it did it did need improvement a lot of it um and i think if 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 brands at least like ours they're like quite a lot i've seen like the biggest those those are kind of big top of funnel con like articles which are drawing like tons of traffic i i think like the traffic's going to waste anyway i don't see many people like pulling in like you may pull in a few like ebook downloads and things like that and it really works for that model if you're trying to get fill a newsletter list and stuff um but i think like those, that that isn't often where the conversions come from anyway. You can get thousands and thousands of people coming to an article each month and then going and forgetting about you. Um so yeah, I I don't I think if you're if if you have tons of top of funnel content, like like a niche site, I think it's worrying maybe for you if you're a niche site owner, um, what it's gonna do to you. But if you're a like a B2B brand, um like the I think the conversion rate stats are like pretty obvious where where it comes from and a lot of top of funnel content is not doing much for them anyway um yeah that being said i do i do think if you have some really like what i call like tier one topics stuff that is very related to your brand like if you're a if you're ahrefs for example who that maybe a top of funnel keyword for them might be like how to do keyword research but for them that's so like tier one and aligned with what they do that they're able to talk about their product like all day in that article um or like what is keyword research kind of thing they're able to walk you through it and like for them it might be a bit of a, a damage to then have search ai talk about that subject so yeah i think um i think most people won't see as much of an impact on conversion rates uh, as as they expect, but their traffic will probably take a hit. That will be interesting to see. But yeah, on on certain top of funnel keywords, if they're really al aligned to your brand, you might um, you see a drop of traffic. That's yeah, it's yeah. Who knows what the effect of that is? I, I yeah, it's hard to say. But one of the things that uh, how the pack does is create detailed case studies of companies that grow with SEO. Uh, at this point, you've done quite a few of these uh, case studies, and I would like to to ask what are the main elements that define success when it comes to SEO as we know it today, right? And maybe some of these elements uh, be applicable to you know the future of SEO. But let's let's uh, focus on today. What, based on the extensive like research and analysis you've conducted? are the elements of success yeah that's a good question um i i think the patterns that come out in all of this are like become very obvious and and it's actually not that surprising that like great content and great links is the answer to all your problems at all times but um yeah i think like i've interviewed a lot of brand like big brands like monday.com or hotjar or, or whatever like all of those big brands are like and before they had a lot of content are like pumping it out like they're, they're not they're not um they're not moving slowly basically on this like they've got a budget for it and and they're pumping it out and i think i think that's a key lesson really like if you have zero blog posts it's better to go quickly and learn from what you've your data from from what you get in terms of the traffic um and once you've got 100 blog posts on your website you can start thinking like okay let's go back let's get it up to date let's see why it isn't all ranking or why it is ranking like how can we improve it we needed yeah more links or we needed like this actually not as good as the rest of our competitors and things um but you need a library you need like a a good library of of content for your for your niche um i think that's something all big brands with tons of traffic have is a lot and lot of content um and the other thing is is like links and i think like most people on those case studies don't they don't often uh mention it links like they're like oh we just made all this content but you but they're big brands like they have 
they're like household names. They've done like, they also have a huge PR team and advertising team who's, they're mentioned in like every famous news site in the world because of this. Um, yeah, that, that, that is ultimately what you need to, to, to win like top tier competitive keywords, I think. Um, and they often don't mention that part of, part of it. Um, so that's much harder to do. Like it's much, it's a, it's a big, really a big brand game SEO. It's really hard to, it's really hard to do unless you, you're willing to, to spend budget on it. Um, yeah, go on. Are there any case studies that, uh, like, uh, stood out, uh, among the rest? Um, I love all of them. I mean, all of them are like ha about how to, to grow really quickly. I, I think, um, aura.com is really cool. They, um, that's Gaetano who, yeah, some people know if you're kind of in the sphere of LinkedIn and SEO. Um, yeah, I mean, it's like, I think they did like 20 articles a month. They grew to like a million traffic in a year. Um, and I think they showed what you could do without making a hundred articles a month, which all the other brands were doing. Um, so that was cool. Um, I, I also think I had, I often have niche site owners on the, on the podcast. And I think that's important because I think we can learn a lot from them. Some of them for in, in the SaaS world about how they like, yeah, try to prioritize things and, and, and grow in that sense. And I think there's one, there's one guy called Brandon, um, Sol Talamakia, I think his name is, um, and he owns retrododo.com and now cardgamer.com. And I've done both those case studies, um, and retrododo.com has like 2 million traffic a month now and card gamer, he's just launched it and it has a hundred thousand a month. Um, and they both, yeah, I think at the time when I interviewed him, retrododo was making like $50,000 in like ad money and affiliate money a month. Um, which is insane as like a, a solo creator. I think every SEO has that kind of dream to like have their own sites and just work for doing what they love to do and, and things. Um, but he, unlike most niche site owners that were like killed in this like latest Google content, like helpful content update and, um, yeah, whatever it was, one of the many changes that they've been releasing at the moment, um, like he wasn't hit by it he was done, he did well out of it and. I think the philosophy that he brings to all of the content and the way he builds those niche sites is important. So I think that was one of my favorites. Um, and just to, yeah, just to like hit his like philosophy is about building brands. Like he's like, I, I don't want to build a niche site that I can sell in a year. I want to have like a 20 year long business and then media, like to be one of the big players in media, um, which means every article has me literally reviewing products on video and he takes like real pictures and it's all real experience. And it's, yeah, the stuff that I would say embodies like a good quality content, basically like very helpful for the audience and, um, and that kind of thing. So yeah, that's a good one. If you want to dig into like his philosophy now go check that out. The podcasts are all free, but you have to pay to read the case studies. Um, yeah, I think that's, that's it. I mean, talk about all of it. There's so, there's so many from so many different areas, but yeah, people can go check them out. Okay. Um, we discussed what makes a successful SEO case study. What about SEO mistakes that you, that you see companies make very often? Um, what would you say are the mistakes that you have like seen with, you know, the clients you work uh, with or the, the case studies you do, or it may be that you're like, uh, through your discussions with SEO people, you see that companies make these mistakes very often. Yeah. I probably have like a very long list uh, of, mis of SEO mistakes. Like I think everyone, like we, I think over intellectualize it in our industry and we just like talk about all these like very nuanced things, but we don't realize like the most, the 99% of people don't have a clue what we're talking about. Um, and you can tell that from most websites you go to, um, I'd say, I'd say like, this is not strictly SEO, but I think it influences it. I just think you're like, 
a like user experience on a website. Like sometimes I work with people, almost kick off kick off like working with someone, and like the first thing I have to do really is totally turn that around. Like people, I think forget they think about themselves too much, what they want, and forget a lot about the fact that someone has to come to your blog and like first impressions matter and like why would they really trust you who are you there's none of that on there like it's a really like piece of crap website and it's like yeah if i landed on there i'd instantly be like no <laughs> i wouldn't even bother reading a word i think it's it's important basically like you don't have to use the free web wordpress like template it's yeah it can be a lot better than that and there's a lot of good examples of great blogs that i think should instill trust from the off so there's one um i think the the most obvious one in seo is going after a really really competitive keywords when you're um when you have nothing like zero authority um yeah like the best way to approach it really like if you if you see any top brand in that in the in the search results it's probably a no from from you but obviously like work with someone who knows how to do keyword research and and also prioritize your business um in that and business potential in in the keywords and they choose um but yeah start low competition i think like traffic is is way underrated like people who have traffic can get more traffic easily in, especially in topics, in, in particular topics. Um, you know, you could have like 400 blog posts on a topic, but if none of them rank at all, I think it's irrelevant really to your topical authority and this kind of thing. So I think like start small, like build into it, go really low competition, get a bit of traffic, start building up your traffic profile. Um, and yeah, I, you can't you can't win the, the, the best stuff from the off like you have to unfortunately spend a lot of con a lot on content for stuff that might not bring you a lot of traffic um but if you prioritize like that's another mistake people make i think is like prioritizing the wrong thing um and if you pick like the right pain points that you can really sit in like your company's authority and knowledge and expertise and answer a question like that's so even if only 100 people a month are searching for it like that's very powerful i think um, so prioritizing like what you know, what your audience really wants to know, um, and connecting with them there, like that's that's um, way more powerful than writing another like ten like marketing software uh, tools article, which you're never going to win anyway. But um, yeah, so those are three things. I could probably go on forever. So yeah, you you, you go on. Um, I would like to discuss programmatic SEO a bit. You, there's a lot of uh, noise about it, and many people, um, you know, talk about it online, especially on on LinkedIn. Um, you have um, programmatic SEO case studies from some pretty well known names, such as Webflow, uh, UserPilot. My question is, what role do you think programmatic SEO will play in the future of SEO and how can companies leverage it? Yeah, it's a good question. Um, pro I, I, pr programmatic SEO is like a problematic thing, I think, because uh, for so many people, it means uh, sacrificing like it, it just means like spamming anything out and I don't think you should be doing programmatic SEO if that means the quality of your output is terrible um, like the best programmatic SEO is like it's good and it delivers high value but at scale and if you can't do the high value part I don't think you sh should do the scale part in my opinion but yeah I, th the, I think the role of programmatic with AI has, it's, has made it increasingly easier to do that value part um for for people um so i think like with if with with ai like we're, we're obviously going to see like a massive amount of increase in in programmatic stuff and i i would say especially at the top of top of the funnel um i think a lot of programmatic was top of funnel anyway but um yeah i think i uh, 
I think, yeah, exactly. I think, I think that's it. Like, I really like what like Jake Ward says on this. Like, he is in, in the SEO industry and he owns, owns Byword, which is like an AI uh, content generation tool. Um, and what he says, which is, yeah, like, I think I totally align on it really is that like this top of funnel stuff that's kind of at risk now anyway, that aren't that related to your brand, like pump up your traffic numbers and give you that kind of brand awareness through um google like that's the stuff like your dictionaries or like your, your glossaries for your industry and stuff that stuff is really perfect for, for ai um and it's the same with like if you have lots of very obvious patterns like how to do how to do how to block youtube on google chrome and then you have that for every other device like if you have something like that which is a very obvious pattern and you can nail the process and make quality content using AI. That's like a really good play, but that should be used to free up your time to use like quality human writing to 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 do the bottom of funnel stuff that actually converts. Um, so I think, yeah, there's some like fun things you can do with it, and uh, there is a lot of brands doing some some fun stuff with it. But there's also a lot of people pumping out crap right now and it's going to be ever more competitive now that AI has come along. You mentioned AI um, a couple of times and I would like to hear your thoughts on it. Um, thoughts on AI, whether you have found any use cases for it and whether you would uh, use it for content creation for any of your clients or you know uh, companies you consult with. Yeah, I think I I push my clients away from it right now, um, because we're because like I like I just said like I think I prioritize with my clients stuff that actually converts like important pain point stuff, um, like competitor alternatives list like best softwares all of that kind of stuff which actually um, like if we can scale that with human writers then then it gets it gets way more way more results i think um but yeah there's there's like something we're considering is exactly what i talked about like the glossaries like the dictionaries like stuff that just we want to pump up our numbers and 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 things like that like we definitely would start experimenting that sense and the the other way to do it which i've seen like massive success with with my one of my clients is just streamlining it like taking an article like still human over like a lot of human oversight um but like when we have 10 like 20 articles that follow the exact same format it starts to be like okay where can we use something to automate a bit of this um and so like with that we were able to reduce the content price down from like say like 500 an article to 300 an article we still take a lot of like like i still wanted a really good writer to make sure the end product was really good, um, but it could like literally quarter the time they spent on it, which meant we could reduce the reduce the overall cost of it. Um, yeah, so that that kind of thing, and I use I use it in my day to day life all the time. A lot of the time for like ideating, you know, like give me ten really good topics that will work on LinkedIn, and I it just comes up with an idea, and I maybe I pick one in like thirty or something, and I think okay, let's do that. Um, but it's just about coming up with an idea. It's not about writing. Um, yeah, I still don't. I still, I still think the content I like to make is like expert insights, like really, really good, like understanding of the audience and what they do already know, what they want to know, like um, what's going to work and resonate with them. And I think AI just doesn't have that like nuance right now. Um, yeah. What about you? Let me flip. To you. Uh, so we actually took a stance a few months ago and said that we are not touching it for content creation. And, yeah. um, you know, I mean, nothing changed since, since then. Um, the dust has settled and there is way less noise around it, um, which is good. And it also shows me that it may not be the thing that we all thought it would be initially, right? Um, I'm not saying that it will not 
have a positive impact moving forward uh, in terms of like technology and getting uh, things done faster and so on. But everyone thought that, you know, crypto is going to change the world and it hasn't. Uh, so yeah, so I'm not saying that there won't be practical applications of AI. I think that there will be. Uh, it says that when it comes to concreation, I really can't see how it can like do things better, right? Because uh, as you mentioned, like it's another thing writing a piece of content. For example, we published something on our blog about um, Paddle's uh, YouTube uh, strategy and Paddle Studios and how they do things and so on. I mean, you can't have AI now. You can't have AI write this piece of content or come come up with the idea in the first place, right? Um, and of course, this piece of content resonates, and such piece of content resonate because you know it's not the like cookie cutter approach of for us as an agency um, going to like creating a piece of content that's a list post and targeting the term best content marketing agencies, right? I mean, it's a, it's a completely different approach, and I can't see how AI can help with that. And at the same time, we you know we serve clients. One of the things we do is con creation, right? And we wanted to be like transparent and say that we are not using it. Um, now, having that said, we see some practical applications, and in general, experiment with it uh, for. As you mentioned, like uh, common ideas, um, topic ideation, and things like that. Um, but when it comes to concreation, no. I, and if it comes to that, I mean, that's not an industry I, I want to be in, right? Because like, what's the point? Yeah, I think, I think, yeah, it's a good point. I, I think it's also something that like, if we're talking B two B SaaS, just like is is, it's not really what works with with this audience anyway. Um. Yeah, I think like the the opportunities aren't endless. Basically, right now there are still opportunities like in some industries to get out like quite quite good basic content, but like those will go. So if you're gonna do some AI, like figure it out now, be the first in your industry or something. But still, it's it's not gonna be like the save, save all. But like, I think people like us who, I don't know, like have this, like we want to make a really good piece of content that like resonates and like, like, I don't think we were the target audience anyway. Like I think AI will re replace like 99% of the writers out there who are like really like, yeah. Right now I, I test I test writers, for example, I test quite a lot of writers. And some of them, I, I think ChatGPT would do a better job than this. And I, yeah, I it's, I think maybe it did do it, to be fair, maybe it, it did write that article, but I think at the end of the day, yeah, that, that's gone now. And I think a lot of agencies, like not your agency, but like some I take over from with my clients have just the last two years spent writing 500 word articles that are terrible and have never ranked and have been saying to the clients anyway, like, oh, look, new new content and my AI is. I agree. I agree. The problem is that I, I had this discussion with uh, Emilia uh, the other day for sure, uh, you know, community and sure, not podcast, but interview series. And what I said is that the companies that serve professional, that um, serve the SaaS industry and offer professional services we haven't done a good job showing what's different between what we do and what AI can do. And the problem was with content marketing for SaaS companies is not AI. The problem is that there was and still is a lot of bad content and cookie cutter content. Yeah. Either way, I mean, with AI or not, the, the content was, you know, you, you, you will see something more creative you would see just the uh, like you know creatives uh, uh sorry alternatives and like best something 
um, kind of posts, which is okay because this drives this this like piece of content drives signups. But I mean, competition is very uh, intense, and you, you see all sorts of websites and publishers, even Forbes, uh, getting into that that game. So. I don't know if you would like to compete against Forbes or Zapier or whatever. Um, yeah. And at the same time, like w we got to a point where you really can't find anything that's that's creative enough to to draw attention and like stand out. And this is the real the real problem. Content marketing ha had a problem before AI, and the reason was bad content marketing. Um, yeah. Now AI is just going to amplify that, but it's not like everything was perfect uh, before AI came into play. The, 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 and this is exactly why, like what you've described there is exactly why uh, like I've swung all my clients and like why I talk about way more into that quality side of things. Like this is even more of an opportunity to differentiate and stand out. Um, like or anyone who is using google in any way is just just hates it like they hate like the crap content they find there like they hate and i every personally every time i work with a client and i see like all the top 10 results are just rubbish and like like not not even thin but just like not interesting like you said not creative i just think that's an opportunity like we'll be the one on there that then that that makes them go oh wow cool like who is this it's not not your typical thing and I think if, if that's what good marketing is, that's my newsletter today, actually. It's like, as soon as something becomes best practice, which in SEO, like basically best practice is like copy what's on the currently ranking. As soon as that becomes best practice, it's not best practice anymore. Like you're the same as everyone else. What's the point? Why, why would someone choose you? And okay, yes, like play the game of SEO, but like, why not do that and stand out, be creative? Yeah. Um, I think that's a great way to to wrap things up uh, and close this episode. Um, anything we can expect in the future from um, how the fuck? Anything that you are working on that people should should know about? Um, no, <laughs> not right now. I think like I have loads of ideas, but I don't want to announce them yet. Um, yeah, we'll just keep, like, I'm focused on the newsletter and growing that right now. Um, I have, the podcast is on pause, so that will come back at some point. Um, it's just, like, it took a break over the summer for for a month, and I've continued that break. <laughs> yeah, that's, uh, that's totally fine, I mean. Yeah, but it's coming back, and I, I hopefully I'm going to bring on, like, someone as well, like a host, or I'm going to make it, like, a theme like 10 episodes about ai and we'll get to the bottom of this um something like that but yeah it's gonna, i want it to be way more creative like my 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 like ultimate goal of a podcast would to would be like one of those like crime series where like we we tell like a really cool story all the way along and we get like different experts to like jump in and give their opinion and it's like a curated podcast like no one's doing that in b2b i don't know why well because it's time consuming um, it's exactly why I'm not doing it. It's so much effort. Um, but I would love to do that, like a 10 episode series that's like, yeah, done well. So yeah, watch this space maybe next year. That's that's a good idea, actually. I haven't thought of anything similar. That's that's a good idea. I mean, we did digest, which is like a curation of episodes we, we've done in the past on specific topics like AI, for example, or, or one we published recently that went pretty well on the future of SEO. Um, nice. But I mean, uh, what you're describing is slightly uh, different, and I, I like it. I like it. Um, so that was a nice conversation. Uh, last question I have for you, Ben: When ca where can people find out more and like get in touch, uh, say hi if they'd like to? Yeah, go go on LinkedIn. Basically, like that's my my point of contact. Benjamin, Benjamin or Ben Goody, I'm on there. Um, and don't just click connect, like click connect and say something because I have like 800 connection requests right now that I have ignored every single one just because it's too overwhelming. But if you say something, 
hi, anything, I'll, I'll, I'll connect. So. LinkedIn then. We will drop it in the show notes. Ben, thank you very much for, for this conversation. Thank you. Thanks for having me on. Been a pleasure.